So who are you? What do you have to say for yourself? I bet in this holiday season that you have an identity, either that you take on for yourself or that your family has assigned you for um, years on end or that you feel like the culture is loading onto you. Maybe it's the family diplomat identity. Many of our families have that one person who seems to be tasked with keeping the in-laws and the outlaws and the cranky toddlers and the stretch, stressed out and stretched out middle-aged moms happy, right? The one who negotiates the calendar very carefully so that the appropriate amount of time is spent with all of the various families and step families and extended families to keep everyone happy. Maybe that's you. Or maybe you have been given the identity of the provider, the one who is supposed to come up with the resources to provide gifts big enough to satisfy this world's definition of enough. And what that might be, I don't know. It doesn't seem like there ever is enough. Maybe you have seen commercials these days that tell us that a diamond ring needs to have not just one stone, but two. You need two diamond rings. Do two diamonds in a ring that you should give this year so that there is tangible mineral proof that your spouse is not only the love of your life, but also your best friend. And if it isn't there in that ring, it might not be true. Right? The, the stakes go up and up every year if you are the provider. Or maybe your identity is the perfect arranger of holiday moments. You're the one that stages the photos that will be so lovely they could go in a catalog and you're proud to put them up on the internet. You're the person who builds the gingerbread house that does not lean like everyone else's. You are the one who creates memories that have that sparkle to them and don't have the blemish of who's kicking who underneath the table. You are the arranger of the perfect memories. Maybe you have known that identity or tried to live up to it. Or the identity of the rescuer, of that family member who is so dear to everyone and is so lost in their um, pain or their addiction or their broken relationship that if you could just get them straightened out and set things right, boy, wouldn't that be, this is your job, right? And many times, we have those jobs assigned to us or we take them on. Or maybe our identity is the happy mother or the cheerful friend, the uh, reliable brother, the jolly co-worker, even while in our own hearts. None of that is true. And our hearts are aching and our hearts are struck with the loneliness or the disappointment or any number of those other blows that this world can give us and pile on and on. Who are you? Who does the world try to tell you you need to be this holiday season? Sin lies to us, huh? Sin lies to us and says it's all on you. You have to be it all. You have to do it all. You have got to hold it all together. It all revolves around you, and you are responsible to make it all happen, whatever it might be. Sin lies to us. And from there, it kind of works its way up to more blatant lies, which are, you are doing it all. How about some of this meet your needs, right? This is, it's really here to meet your needs. For your need for the best holiday, your need for the perfect gift, your desire to have a partner who can read your mind, or children who are appropriately grateful, or a sister who keeps her mouth shut for once. Sin has this habit of just ratcheting up the lies and tells us special holiday editions of the lie that is the world revolves around you, either because you're holding it up or because you are the purpose of it all. And it tells those holiday versions with good background music and a warm, soft, focused lens, doesn't it? Sin loves to tell us that we're at the center of the universe, which makes this encounter with John all the more compelling. Here is John. Out in the wilderness, there's nothing there. 
You don't go there for any reason. You pass through it to get to the city. And John's out there. And something about him is so compelling that people are leaving the city and coming out to him. Something about John is so powerful that the, the authorities and the powers that be in the city are feeling like they need to keep tabs on him. They've got to send someone out there to him. Everyone out there is centered all around John. He's got their attention, right? And they've got a couple of questions. Who are you? And you can just see the script in their mind. Oh, I, I could be this, it could be that. All right, here are my categories, and I'm going to put you in one. And the first thing he says is, I am not the Messiah. I am not the Messiah. He confessed it and did not deny it. The text has to kind of pile on the language. They never even asked him. And he says, no, nope, not me. That is not me. And no, while you're at it, I'm not Elijah. No, I'm not the prophet. None of those things. I'm not a part of that system. I'm not going to play that game. I'm not going to step into this preconceived idea that you've got for me of what I need to be and who I ought to be. And of course, there's another set of lies that we're told. But before, actually, let me go back because John has sidestepped these things, but there's another piece, right? He knows there's an actual Messiah. He does not have to be the Messiah because God has handled this. I am not the Messiah, he says, and he knows that something else is coming. And for us, that's the good news, isn't it? We do not have to be the Messiah. You are not the Messiah. I am not the Savior of the world, and God has already handled this. So whether it is the perfect holiday or elimination, elimination of poverty or dealing with the addiction in our family, none of that is solely on us. God is the one who is in charge. And God has sent this Messiah. God is listening, and God is ready to respond, and we are not alone. Now we get to the second set of lies, which Finn likes to tell us when we, when we fail at, at being the center of the universe or when things are not going as we had hoped, the second batch of lies go like this. It's your fault, right? Nobody cares. That mistake that keeps you up at night, you are your mistakes. Have you heard that lie before? Sin tries to tell us, give up. Who do you think you are? You don't matter. And again, John steps aside from those. The questioners come at him and they're expecting, well, he's, he's somebody important. The, you know, he's the Messiah, he's Elijah, he's, no, okay. Well then, who do you think you are to be out here baptizing and teaching? You're not a priest. You're none of these prophesied people. Knock it off. Who do you think you are? What makes you think you have the right to do this? Leave it to the professionals. And John's answer when they say, what do you have to say about yourself is, I'm not out here saying things about myself. I'm not out here thinking about who I am. I'm out here to point to something bigger. I'm out here to point to something bigger. And the truth of that bigger thing, the truth of the Messiah that is in the midst of us and we don't even recognize him, that's what reveals those lies for what they are that you're not important, that you don't matter, that you might as well just be quiet and go home. Because the presence of Jesus in our midst is the sign that the God of the universe loves humanity so much, loves each individual person so much that no one is a waste. No one is beyond hope. Every single one matters, not because they get it right often enough to be in his good graces, not because they fit perfectly into the boxes and identities that the world hands them, but because the word became flesh, because God said human lives and human bodies are so valuable that I'm going to come and join them. Just like me, just like you in a body, and in a life that is as vulnerable as we are, I'm going to join them. And I'm going to do that so that when they are plowing headlong into the next ditch, which comes 
at least if your life is anything like most human beings' lives, quite regularly, sometimes the ditches are of our own making, sometimes the ditches are pre-prepared for us, but when they are plowing headlong into that next ditch, I can be there ahead of them. I can already have been through suffering and death and despair and isolation so that they will never be alone. So those other lies, John knows, don't matter because he knows that the Messiah is already in the midst of the people he's talking with. I'm not much of one for um, cutesy phrases, but this one has always stuck with me, and I find myself saying it an awful lot. I think John is a model for us of sort of faithful humility, right? He says right off the bat, I'm not the Messiah, and yet he's perfectly able to go on doing his thing, pointing to Jesus, not worrying about who he is or where he came from or what people think about him in his ugly clothes and bug breath. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. A lot of times we feel like it is. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less, right? It's realizing that you are not the center of the universe, and thanks be to God, there is someone who is the center of the universe and can hold it together way better than I can and can be the center of the universe and also that little tiny baby in the manger and the one who we do not even know standing in our midst and the one who will come to make all things new. John shows us what living faith looks like that trust and hope that is anchored in the ground like those oaks of righteousness, anchored and rooted not in ourselves, not in who we think we're supposed to be, not in who our spouse tells us they need us to be, not anchored in who the world tells us we need to be or what the world tells us we need to buy, anchored in the confidence that we are one for whom Christ died and that he is already in our midst, going ahead of us, in love. Thanks be to God.